continue with what we began last week. I have to go ahead and tell you. Uh, we will finish up with Abraham this morning. We'll get to Paul next week. How about that? Um, but um, as part of the ser- as part of the message, some of you are going to say, "What?" If you weren't with us last week, but those of you who were around, um, will will you'll get sort of a P.S. But I'll give you a little bit more. But I have something to show you as we begin this morning. When we don't understand, we're beginning with Abraham this morning. What I want to show you is small and blue. <laughs> this is my passport. <laughs> It is found. It's just like the lost sheep, one of them and all the others. It is found. Um, It was lost by me. God kept his hand on it for all that time. It was found by Melrose. And I have to laugh. She called or she sent a message and then I called her back. I think it was Thursday evening. And she, she, she sent me a picture. And it was a picture of this and a little plastic thing. It has been in the office since uh, a few days after the medical mission, the church office since a few days after the medical mission. I'd taken it out. I'd put it, put it at home on top of my desk. That's the last place I remembered it. And then I, what I obviously had done in the meantime, I'd gathered up all the receipts from medical mission, all of the extra pesos, and apparently this passport as well, and put it in a bag and put it in the office because, you know, all the receipts have to be figured out and all the finances have to measure up because you know it's God's money. We've got to be good with God's money, right? We should be good with all money, but especially with God's money. So it was up there. And afterwards, I just had to laugh because Melrose searched that bag. It was a small bag, this big. She searched it three times, three times, and she did not find it until after the whole U.S. team got back to the U.S. within an hour of landing in the U.S., Melrose found the passport, (laughs) found my passport. So I'm pretty sure it's God. And uh, as somebody said, you heard the uh, testimony that uh, Rebecca gave this morning about Cece, about this young young girl who became the translator. Uh, Had I been there and had been in the class because we two were going to team teach, Cece staying in that class and having that opportunity would not have happened. That's not how it would have worked. That's not how it would have worked out, as somebody shared with, uh, with uh, Rebecca upstairs just a little bit ago. Because I'm still uh, asking God and still seeing, okay, God, why did this happen, you know, after it killed, after it killed me um, and broke my heart a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it was a revelation. It's like, that's right. Uh, that opportunity would never have happened, would never have come to pass had not my passport been lost and I'd had to stay here. So praise the Lord. You know, when God asks things of us and when we can say yes or no, of course, I didn't have a choice in this, you know. It was gone. I couldn't find it. And and God was really good to hide it so well because if I had found it or if I could have gotten another passport, I would have been there. And God knows that sometimes. But God in his love and in his great plan for each one of us, he, he really, he truly, he does, he does what is best. And what a privilege it is for us, even in sacrifice, even in these ways, to give up things for greater things. Amen? It really is. And God, God is so good. And we're going to continue talking about, about that this morning. So as we continue this morning, well, when we don't understand, uh, quite a few of you were not here last week. A lot of you were. So just as we, as we go into it this morning, we, we are looking at in the lives of two great men of the Bible. In the Old Testament, Abraham. In the New Testament, Paul, we're looking at two great men of the Bible that faced things in their lives that they could not understand and for which God did not give them an answer. In, and as we look at these two, we'll get into Paul next week, but as we look at these two, we see this wide range of experience with these two men of God And I believe you and I can find, we can find ourselves either at one end or the other or somewhere in between. In Abraham's case, it was God, as we know. Let's go ahead and put up that first scripture just as a reminder. Sometime sometime later, God tested Abraham. I don't want to talk a lot more about testing this morning. We'll bring it up a little bit. But I encourage you, if you were not with us last week, go back to, our, to the church, to the Facebook page or to the YouTube channel and go back and listen to the message from last week as we talked a lot more about why, what God was doing in testing. And so we see that God tested Abraham. But as we look at Abraham's example, it's very 
clear, it's the voice of God, right? God tested Abraham. Next week, when we look at Paul, we will see very clearly something very different. God, we do not, we don't hear about God at first in Paul's tough thing that he goes through, this hard to understand thing. In Paul's case, it will be very clear. Paul says, a messenger of Satan, a messenger of Satan in this circumstance of his life that was difficult to understand. And I believe you and I, we find ourselves somewhere between these two. Sometimes it's God and we know it's God, but we don't understand. We, we don't understand. We say, we, God, how can this be? Uh, God, why? Why not? Why me? We, these are questions that we ask. This is not fair if we just, if we demand. And at other times we look at something and we see very clearly, this is the enemy. It's very, very clear. It's the enemy. And yet Paul was allowed to be in a situation like that as well. With Abraham's, it's something that happens suddenly and it's an immediate crisis. Now, my passport is not nearly on the level of Abraham offering up Isaac. I know that but it killed me nevertheless. But it was a crisis, it was a short term, it was a short term thing, and we, we all go through short term things. But if you go back, as we will, uh, if you go ahead and read, this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, if we look at Paul, we will see that from the way it is written, and it's only in three or four verses, Paul's situation was of long duration. It wasn't just a short thing. It wasn't just a few, it wasn't just a few days. It kept on going on. And as I was preparing and praying, and as I do, as, as we as pastors pray for you and have been praying for you, for some of you, I look at things that you are going through in your lives, some things I don't know unless you share, and some of you are going through hard times, and you've been going through hard times and you've been doing what is right you've been doing what you know to do you've been praying and asking God and you don't it doesn't seem that you're there's rebellion or there's sin in your life or anything like that and yet God has not changed your circumstances he hasn't answered your prayer he hasn't answered it in the way that you want he hasn't given you an explanation and there you are and you're just well God what's going on and for you for those of you it's longer term you will find yourselves more in what in what we will look at next week when we look at Paul who who came before the Lord and pers with persistence prayed and said God do this God do this but God is so good to us brothers and sisters because he knows our human experience and because he knows our human experience he knows that we will find ourselves in these times and he allows these times in our lives but he never leaves us on our own and I believe in his love for us the same God that doesn't answer our prayers when we ask. The same God that doesn't give us an explanation when we don't understand why this happened. The same God that seems silent at these times is still the same God who tells Paul, my grace is enough for you is the same God who inspired the prophets in the Old Testament to write, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, Pr plans to prosper you, to give you hope and a future. This is the same God. It's the same God. And though he may not give us answers, though he may not give us explanations that we long for in our humanness, he gives us what we must have in these times we face, whether they are short, whether they are long, whether they are severe or, or, or protracted and uh, lighter in some way. God gives us what we must have in these times. And as we look at the lives of Abraham and Paul, we see as we began to see last week. And so we continue this morning. Let's do just a quick review of Abraham as we, as we move forward. I I'll tell you this right now. Um, I don't even know which sister spoke to my sister, Rebecca, in, at meet and greet and said, it, who was it? Wave. She's gone now. Okay, I think she's, up, she's upstairs. She's one of the Sunday school teachers. For me, there's an explanation. There's one of the reasons I didn't think of that um, before, before I heard it this morning, and neither, and neither did Rebecca. And some things God lets us know. I, I think God almost never lets us know in the middle of it. Do, do you know that? Those of you, he almost never lets us know in the middle of it. He gives us what we need. But he doesn't give us the explanation always. He doesn't make everything clear to us. Um, 
but he does give us what we must have. But you know, as we look at this and as we look at Abraham, and I was, we'll get into this more, I think for us as Christians and for us, we live in this world and we, we come into these situations and we, something happens to us or we go, go through something and it is very clear to us, this is not good. Yes? yes. This is not good. And when we look at something and we see this is not good, then it cannot be God. Yes? If it's not good, it's not God. And you and I face this. It's not good. It can't be God. God, why? So God, change it. God, you say to pray persistently. I'm praying persistently. God, change it. And yet God doesn't. And God shows us in the life of Abraham, and especially as we get into the life of Paul, how something can be and can first come to us that is not good and yet is God is in God's hands, is in God's hands. I want to be careful about how I say that because the Bible is very clear. Every good and perfect gift comes from God and he sends no evil, but everything is in his hands. And what can come to us, what the messenger, a messenger of Satan that comes to us as we're going to see next week can still be in God's hands. He's God. It can be good in God's hands. That's why we want to keep in God's hands too, right? We want, to, we want to get there. We don't want to get out from under that. So we look at Abraham, and we've seen this before. We looked at this last week. The great Old Testament figure, Abraham. The great New Testament figure, Paul. And God asks Abraham for his son, Isaac. And he makes it very clear. And he says, um, if I can't see how this can be good, I can't see how it can be God. How, can Abra how, does, how does Abraham, our example, go through this? And we looked at this last time. Let's look at the, the next verse, the next passage. And here we see how Abraham went through something that he didn't understand and that didn't seem good. And what we see, first of all, is that he obeyed and he obeyed immediately. He obeyed imme immediately. He didn't try to, he didn't try to figure it out. He didn't try to do something else. He didn't try to change it or bargain with God. He got up early. He saddled his donkey, took two of his servants, and off they go. So first of all, he obeys co God's command. And I want, I'd like, I want these words to sink into your heart this morning, if you remember nothing else this morning. He obeyed God's command and he let God take care of his promise. Does that make sense to us this morning? So here's God's command or God's call. Abraham does that part. But the promise, Isaac is the son of promise. Isaac is the one that has come from God and been given by God. Isaac is the one through whom all of the blessings of God will come as God has promised Abraham. That's the promise. But Abraham leaves the fulfillment of the promise in God's hands. He just worries about his part. I think we as Christians get into trouble, as Abraham did, when we look at the call of God on our lives, when we see what God has called us to do, how we can obey or not obey, and then we look at, but God, you promised this, but God, you said this, but God, your word, you said you will take care of me and you will do this. And here we are in our trouble, and here we are in our problems, and we look at the promise of God and it seems like how's it going to work out and you and I get into trying to make the promise happen don't we we get into trying to make it work out because God said it was going to work out and so we try to make it work out and we do our way and we do that way can you think of people in the Bible that got into trouble by doing just that apart from our own examples think of Jacob the promise of God. Jacob was the chosen one. Jacob and Esau. Look at the trouble that Jacob got into. God could have taken care of fulfilling the promise in Jacob's life. But Jacob thought, I got to make it happen. God can take care of his promises in our lives, brothers and sisters. So there's Jacob. But we back up uh, the grandson of mighty Abraham, by the way, the grandson. But back up. Abraham himself. Think of, of, of Abraham earlier in his life. Abraham, when he was a much younger man, had the call and the promise of God, I will make of you a great nation. Through you, all the descendants of the world will be blessed. I will bring forth this, 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 and this. And what does Abraham do as the clock ticks? Talk about a biological clock. As that clock ticks, Abraham looks. Here's the promise of God, but it's not happening. I'm old, 
Sarah's old. We're getting older. We're not getting younger. And so what do Abraham and Sarah do? They take the working out and the fulfillment of the promise into their own hands, right? They're going to make it work out. And Sarah is part of it. And Sarah says, here's, here's Hagar. And, and, you know, we look at that and we think, that's so awful. That, that is how it was done by all the people around them in those days. And Ishmael is born. And that is their way of trying to make the promise of God happen. Was there ever more trouble when people got into figuring out the promise of God for themselves than what Abraham and Sarah did in that moment? That's, now talk about trouble. So I want to encourage you this morning, rather than just saying, oh, that's trouble. I want to encourage you this morning. Some of us as well, as we have walked with God, we have come to places where we have tried to make things happen in our lives that we thought that was God. That's how God can work. I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to, here, here, God, let me help you. Let, let me help you in this. And we get involved and we have made a mess of things. Have we not? Have you ever made a mess of things in your life? I've made a mess of things in my life. Oh, just like Abraham and Sarah and Hagar and Ishmael. And we make a mess of things and we look at the mess and we think, Oh God, help me now. And God in his mercy and his love does help us. And here we come to Abraham many, many years later. And God still fulfills his promise in his life and gives him Isaac, the son of promise. And so as we look at this, we look at how could, how could Abraham do that? How could Abraham so quickly respond to the Lord? I believe in part, not only is it because he had really learned about God by this point, as we'll see a bit later, but it was also that he had learned from his mistakes and his brokenness with God. Don't you, don't you think so? Brothers and sisters, it would be a sad thing indeed if you and I go through our Christian lives and we keep repeating the same mistakes. We keep repeating the same mistakes. Brothers and sisters, God wants us to move on from that. And Abraham learned. And that's why I think, in part, Abraham was able to get up early that morning and gather, chop the wood himself, and get the fire, and get the knife, and take it and set out in immediate obedience to the call of God and leaving in God's hands the promise that was going to come through Isaac. He had learned. And so I urge you and I encourage you this morning, if you are facing that this morning, if that's in your heart and in your life, don't look back and say, well, I've blown it. Say, God, I blew it, but you still loved me. I've learned from that. And when you call me again, and when this situation arises again, I'm going to obey you. I'm going to get up early, and I'm going to chop the wood, and I'm going to take the fire, and I'm going to pick up the knife that will slay that which I love, which is dear to me, which I thought you gave me, which I thought was your promise to me, and you've put your hand on it in my life but I'm going to obey you. And I think that's why, that's one of the reasons Abraham was able to do that. And that just encourages us as well that our God is able to take our perfections in our lives and it's for his glory. And God is able to take the failures in our lives and use it for his glory as well. Amen? Amen. And so he starts walking with God. And I want you to see, as we said last week, that... Uh, sorry, back up just, just a minute again, uh, pre preceding slide. I want you to see that what it calls of Abraham is the deepest, closest, most beloved thing of him that God has given him. And I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, there will come a time in your life when there will be things that God says, give me this, let go of this, give it up. And you and I will say, but God, it's good. And God will say, give it to me. And God will say, give it to me. And we will say, but God, that's the ministry that you gave me. And God will say, give it to me. Or God will close a door. A door will close and we'll say, but God, you opened that door. But it will remain closed. And those brothers and sisters 
are our Isaacs, and they are our times as well. It will come to every one of us, not just Abraham, 3,500 years ago. It comes to each one of us. We take care of the obedience. God takes care of the promise. Amen? Amen. And then we go forward a little bit more. Let's look at the next one. And what do we see here? The question that anybody would have. And some of you asked me last week, not just one, several of you. You came up to me after the service and you said, Pastor Jennifer, Abraham didn't really think he was going to have to sacrifice Isaac, did he? He didn't really think. He knew because he said, we're going to go there and we'll return, we're, we'll return here. He, he didn't really think, right? He, he knew he wouldn't really have to sacrifice Isaac. And I said, nope, he didn't know that. He didn't know that. He didn't have a, 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 let me ask you, how many of you in school, before you were Christians, you had a cheat sheet for the test? You had a cheat sheet? Pauline, who is so good, says, cheat sheet, what's a cheat sheet? You know, the answers to the test before the test comes, you're not supposed to have it. It's supposed to be here and here, but you've got it, as I sometimes found when I was teaching, students would sometimes have it written here. <laughs> uh, yeah, or they'd have it written here, or they would cough, <coughs> and, and it would be here, but you never did that, right? No, you were so good. <laughs> Some of us did that, right? No? Well, oh, Pastor Renee, even then. Sometimes they would write it on their desks. Oh, we, we just found answers all over the place, <laughs> all over the place. Uh, so that's what, that's what we say when we mean a cheat sheet. And, and truly, we look at this, and we were laughing about that, uh, laughing about it, but some of us, we, so, we sort of think God gave Abraham a cheat sheet, right? But you know what, brother, sister, brothers and sisters, apart from all laughter and things like that, if God had given Abraham a cheat sheet, it wouldn't have been a test. It wouldn't have been a test. And there would be no reason for this passage of Abraham's life to be included in the Word for you and for me. There would be nothing we could learn from Abraham in this example if God had said, by the way, I'm not really going to ask for Isaac. You're not really going to have to kill him. There would have been nothing there for us. If it were easy, it wouldn't be a test. If it didn't do something in his heart and character, it wouldn't be a test. If God didn't really ask for Isaac, it wouldn't be a test. But it was a test, just as there are tests for you and me. And so we look at these two things. Abraham says we will worship there and then we will come right back here. Now remember what I told you last week? This is the first time that worship is used, this word, it's the first time it's used in the Bible in relation to man worshiping God. So that tells me something as I look at this. It's the very first time that this word worship is used to worship God. And it is in a hard place. It's in a tough situation. And so we see this. And then we go to the next slide. And uh, this one. And, and Isaac asks a very reasonable question. Where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? And Abraham doesn't lie. He says, God will provide a lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And God did provide a lamb for the burnt offering. But as we're going to see as we look at this, the lamb that God provided was not first the lamb in the thicket at the top of the mountain that was going to be sacrificed. The lamb that God called for from Abraham came from Abraham's heart. It was Isaac. And you say, Pastor Jennifer, how can you say that? I'll show you in just a minute as we look at Hebrews. What God calls for, brothers and sisters, it comes from our hearts. It is what is dear to us. It is what is precious to us. It is, it is, our, it is what comes out of who we are and, and, and the essence of our being and what we love. This is what God calls for. And Abraham says, God will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. Now, some of you have studied and you know the Old Testament well. In this passage in Genesis, God has not yet given the law to Moses. This is, this is before. God has not yet given the law, but there's an offering there. And Abraham understood it. And I want to talk to you just for a minute or two about the type of offering that God is asking of Abraham. The, the command, the call that God is asking of Abraham. 
And the, what God is asking of Abraham is something that later on, when the law is given, is called the whole burnt offering. It's called the whole burnt offering. And we don't have time to go into detail this morning, but it, it speaks to us this morning. Because the whole burnt offering was not commanded. You didn't have to do it. It was your choice. It was not a sin offering. The sin offering, you had to do it. Because if you sinned, there was no relationship. That broke relationship between you and God. That broke the, 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 the fellowship. And sin had to be taken care of for man and for God to have fellowship. But once sin was taken care of, once sin was taken care of, then there were other offerings. And the whole burnt offering came and it came out of a heart and out of a person that was walking with God, that loved God, who was pleased with God, and God was pleased with that person. And that person would say to God, God, I give you more. I give you all. I give you a whole burnt offering, offering not just part, but the whole thing, all of it. And it was a voluntary offering, and it had to do with, with love and relationship. And it had to do with what was dear and precious. And it was brought to the Lord and all of it was burned and given to the Lord. This is what Paul talks about in the New Testament. When he says in Romans chapter 12, we know that, don't we? I beseech you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God. Because we can't do it by ourselves. We can't. Oh, brothers and sisters, these deep things of God, even as much as we love God, I can't give God these deep things in myself. My heart, my humanness, it holds on too strong. And that's why it takes the mercy of God and the grace of God in our lives. He puts in our life, He helps us do what He calls us, what He calls of us. God's so good to us in this way. And, what, and Paul says, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as living sacrifices. What? Holy acceptable. That's the whole burnt offering. That's the whole burnt offering. And when you and I are willing to do that, that's the Isaac. That's the Isaac. It's everything. We do that part. God takes care of all the promises. God takes care of all the promises. And so we see that before the law was given. For some people who say, well, we're living under grace now. Well, Abraham was living under grace too. This was before the law. And yet we see this relationship and we see what God calls. And then after that, in the New Testament, when we're living under grace, Paul says, I beseech you, I beseech you. And so we see this. This is not just for Abraham. This is not just Old Testament. It's for us. But God works into his heart what he calls of him, just as God does for us. And so Abraham is able to say, God will provide a lamb for the burnt offering, my son. We're going to hang on to that. We, we closed on that last week, and we're going to get back to that um, in just a few minutes as we, come to, as we come to the end of this part about Abraham this morning. So we go to the next, play, uh, next slide, Genesis 22, 9 through 10. They arrive at the place where God had told him to go. He builds the altar. He arranges the wood. He ties up Isaac. Isaac, by this time, realizes, I'm the lamb. <laughs> It's true. I'm the lamb. I'm the lamb. It requires something. If it didn't cost something, it wouldn't be a sacrifice. If it doesn't mean much to us, it doesn't mean much to God, brothers and sisters. But if it means something to us, it means something to God. It means something to God. And here's where we see Abraham's submission and faith and obedience without explanation, without understanding, without God saying, don't worry, I'm not really going to take Isaac. And you and I come to this and we say, how could he do that? Because I don't think I could do that. And what I want to say to you this morning is this, yes, you can do it. Yes, you can, because the God of Abraham is your God today. He's your God today. And the writer to Hebrews tells us how Abraham does it. Look with me at Hebrews eleven seventeen and 18. By faith, Abraham 
offered up Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. And I want you to look at two words this morning. And those two words are offered up. Right there. Hebrews 11, 17, and 18. Because some of you said, but Pastor, some of you, you were, you were kind of sure you had the answer or you weren't sure. He, he wasn't, he knew he would, that Isaac wouldn't die, right? No, he did not know that. Because I want to show you as we look at this verse, in Abraham's heart, Isaac was dead. In his heart, he was dead. This phrase here, means in the original language that Isaac had been offered up already. He had already been given as a sacrifice. And that is why when Abraham comes to that point, he picks up the knife to slay Isaac. Brothers and sisters, the battle is not out there, is it? The battle, it's always in our hearts first, isn't it? That's where the battle is fought. That's where the battle is lost. That's where the battle is won. It's much easier than when it gets to that point. And Abraham had already fought the battle and won the battle in his heart. Isaac had been offered up. Isaac had been given to God. That is why the Old Testament and the New Testament as well talk so much about guard your hearts. Be careful with your hearts. Watch what you let put in. Give God your whole hearts because that's where it's won and that's where it's lost. And that's what the enemy wants too. That's what the enemy wants. What real estate does, does the enemy want? He wants this real estate. And it's the one where God wants to have. And that's one of the reasons God says to Abraham, take Isaac. That's, it was his. Isaac was Abraham's heart. And brothers and sisters, you and I have things in our lives. It's our heart. It's our heart. It's who we are as men, as women, as children, as husbands, as wives. That's valuable real estate. But Isaac has already been given. And then we go a little bit further. And here's the answer to the rest of the question. Did Abraham know that God was going to spare Isaac? No, he did not know that. And here we see in Hebrews 11:19, look at the next passage. Some of you are mathematicians and you're really good with numbers and things like that. I am so bad with numbers. But here's a mathematics word for you. And the word reasoned is reckoned and it has to do with exact calculation. That's what the word means. It has to do with exact numbering and counting, a balance and a count. It's not a feeling word. It's not a general word. It's a very exact word. Let me tell you what that means when it comes to this verse right here. Look with me. And here's the key to Abraham's heart and to what he did. Abraham reasoned. He figured it out that God could raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Wait a minute. How could Abraham reckon that God could raise the dead. Had God ever, had Abraham ever seen with his eyes God raise the dead in front of him, as Jesus did when he laid his hands on people? Not that we can see, but now go back with me to earlier in Abra Abraham's life. When God gives Abraham the promise of Isaac, Abraham in his body, in his seed, he can still give life. He could still give life. He was a younger man at that point. When the promise of God comes for Isaac, for this one that will come from God, Sarah could still bear children at that point. When the promise of God came, these things were still possible. But God waited till it was no longer possible. And Sarah in her body was dead. Abraham in his body was dead. And so when Abraham comes to this point, Abraham reasoned God could raise the dead because he had seen it in his own life. From death, God had brought life. And brothers and sisters, how could Abraham do it? How can you and I do it? By the same way. Look at your life. 
What has God done in your life in the past? It was dead, it was gone, and you thought there's no hope, it's broken, it's beyond repair. And I encourage you this morning not to look at what is dead and impossible in your life. Instead, you look to what God has done to show you, I'm the God of the impossible. I repair what is broken. I heal what is hurt. I bring to life what is dead. And when we see that in our own lives, then we come to these points where God puts his hand on our lives and we say, God, why? God, that was from you. God, how can this be you? It would be good if you would do this. And God says, I'm not going to do it that way. No, no, no answer, no explanation. God, why haven't you answered my prayer? And God doesn't tell us why he hasn't answered the prayer. We'll see that next week with Paul. And that is when we are not called just to jump out in darkness and say, well, okay, God. God doesn't do that. He's not that type of God. Instead, in your life today, if this is the situation you are facing, let the Holy Spirit turn your eyes to God, and not just to God, but to what God has done in your life before to do something impossible, to answer the prayer that could not be answered, to keep the promise that could not be kept. This is your God, and he is not called to sacrifice Isaac. We go, he's already sacrificed him. He's not called to literally sacrifice him, but I, Abraham had already done that. Go to the next slide. The angel. He says, don't kill him. And you know what? When it says, Abraham, Abraham, do you know what that means? That means Abraham was not sitting there waiting. One, one and a half. Seriously, that's what we kind of think. When it says, Abraham, Abraham, what that means is Abraham was in the act of slaying him. And the angel of the Lord, the Lord himself, stops him, gets his attention. Abraham, Abraham. Don't do it. Don't do it. And then we come to the place where as we ended, as we ended last week, go to the next passage. What do we say? We come to the place where Abraham said the Lord will provide. Do you know why Abraham said the Lord will provide before he provided? Because Isaac had come out of death. And you and I come to the place where we also can say, our Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides. What do you face this morning? What are you struggling with in your life that you think, God, it's impossible? What are you holding on to that you're saying, God, please, please, please? And God has not seen fit to answer. Can you give it up to him this morning and let him provide? Not your answer, but his answer. Not your provision, but his provision. Not your way of working it out, but his way of working it out. Would you let him be your Jehovah Jireh this morning? Lord, we come to you this morning. We thank you, God, for our brother Abraham, whom we shall meet one day in heaven before too long. And we're going to meet Isaac too. And we thank you, Lord, that you put this man that we put up on such a high pedestal in your word so that we too see that you give us, as you gave Abraham, what is needed, that you provide. Lord, I pray that we, your people, in our struggle and in our weakness would look to you, would lean on you, and receive your provision for all the promises that you have spoken to us and that you have put in our hearts. Lord, we take our hands off and we let you, we choose to let you work out how you will fulfill these promises in our lives. But God, on our part, we give you our Isaacs. God, I give you what I have wanted so badly. 
God, I give you this morning what I have held on to as my right. It's mine. God, I give it to you this morning. I give it to you. I offer up in my heart. Would you provide as you have in the past, as you do today, as you will do every day until the day you bring us to heaven to be with you forever. You are our Jehovah Jireh. In the precious name of Jesus, the true Lamb of God, we pray. Amen. Amen.